you, my quote of the day, Greg, is perfect for you, by the way. Oh, good. I looked it up specifically for you. All right, hold Here we go. Oh, fuck along. You are now tuned in to the real Coach JB Slap Dick Podcast. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. Will I make it? Will I take it to the top? We gon' see. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. Will I make it? Will I take it to the top? We gon' see. It's the what up? What up? Real Coach JB here, man. Another Slapdick Podcast coming at you. 9 2 2020. September 2nd. Another day another dollar during this pandemic this uh crazy times man i got a perfect quote of the day for the per- for a perfect special guest we have on the show today that i'll get to in a minute quote of the day on the september 2nd life is like a camera you focus on what's important capture the good times develop from the negative and if things don't work out you take another shot that's the quote of the day. Title of this show will be called Last Chance. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to all the coaching and entertainment world, man. We lost some iconic figures during this uh, another BS part of the 2020, you know, that 2020 has presented us with. Um, so let's not forget the great coaches, entertainers we've lost. And we already know about the Kobe Bryant's of the world, which I still don't get over. Like I said, there's not a lot of younger folks uh, that I consider a hero. But Kobe's probably that's one guy. Um, but Lute Olson, we lost last week. Uh, great Arizona, University of Arizona coach, won a national championship, 11 conference championships, um, went to the tournament 22 consecutive years. I mean, uh, 85 years old. We lost John Thompson the other day on Sunday. Uh, great, a great uh, head coach, Georgetown, uh, stood for a lot, was a NCAA tournament announcer later on in his years. Um, you know, Coach Allen Iverson, Patrick Ewing, Alonzo Mourning, some greats, and uh, stood for a lot, walked off the court way back in the day. He ran off drug dealers from talking to his players. Um, special guy, Cliff Robinson, uh, who created the headband, basically, in the NBA, um, played in the two finals against the Bulls. And then Chadwick Boseman we lost last week. Obviously, everybody knows it's, it's the single most liked tweet in the history of Twitter. So, um, you know, Black Panther, first black superhero, different things like that. So uh, shout out to those guys. And uh, 2020 continues to be a year to forget. Um, But also it's a year to remember, man, because I think for every struggle we face in life, uh, we also uh, create some tough skin and uh, we learn from it. So this show is brought to you by betonline.ag. Um, did somebody say playoffs? The NBA, Major League Baseball, and NHL are in full swing, and our partners at Bet Online have you covered. So, just so you know, I'm I'm using Bet Online right now today. So, Houston, Oklahoma City game seven. I'm betting on Oklahoma City and Chris Paul because I think James Harden just dribbles the damn ball and shoots. And uh, we'll go we'll go into that later. But so, taking full advantage of sports being back and get into the action with hundreds of odds, futures, and props. For you to bet on and there is other there's always the online casino as well it never closes so head to betonline.ag today and sign up to receive your welcome bonus on your first deposit again that's betonline.ag and sign up today bet on your online sports book experts so saban and his team at alabama remember i got a good, great friend on that staff a couple coaching buddies um Look, I'm a Saban fan because he wins and he graduates his guys and sends them to the NFL, which I always say it's a result-oriented business and profession, and, you know, that's what he does in that profession. But to me, this is a day late and a dollar short, and I just – I do not feel like anything productive came out of it besides kind of a PR stunt, in my opinion. I mean, no disrespect, but it was a reach at best. To me, if this was me and I'm not – no shape, form, or saying I'm a Saban or whatever. But to me, Saban should have been in the back, in my opinion. And it was about the kids, not the coach who makes $9 million a year. Like I said, I got friends on that staff. It just looked like a 
a bit out of sorts to me and, and much too late. And so that's just my take on it. I've been asked a million questions about it. Um, I know people are bashing Saban. I'm not bashing them. I'm just saying it's about the kids and the movement and, you know, all these big time D1 coaches statements came out way late. And uh, I just don't think it was really, really uh, sincere. And when a PR person has to write your statement, I just think that, uh, again, it's a meat market and these babies are the pieces of meat, like I've been saying. So anyway, no further ado. I got a great guest on the show today. Um, hope you guys are tuning in. Um, you know, my, my, my quote was for him and, you know, people know him. Um, he's created some great content for you guys at home to be able to, to watch, um, on Netflix. And he's now an Emmy award winning producer. And uh, of course the last chance you cheer, if you guys haven't watched cheer, make sure you go watch cheer and then last chance you basketball. And if you didn't know, he's also a significant piece of a show on Netflix with the Mitt Romney um, show if you watch that but his name is uh greg whiteley and i want to introduce him and um make sure that you guys understand uh he's a great great friend we created a great bond and uh and and everybody give it up for greg whiteley <laughs> i appreciate you, greg coming on man um i really do i really i know you're busy as hell right now and i appreciate you coming on with me how you been man i've been great um, that I, I, what a generous introduction. I need to, I'm going to go back and, and I need to use that, uh, whatever I go, if I got to go give a pitch, I'm going to go through, just wait a minute, wait a second. Let me, let me just, let me just play that. Uh, you, you're too nice. Next, next time we're pitching the show at Netflix, they need to hear no you. No doubt, man. Sympathy. No doubt. I, I got shot down on that one already, but we'll go over that as another day. So how you doing, man? You, you've been good. Hey, before I dive deep into this deal, I know. Uh, before uh, you get, tell me what you're going on, I know these fans, and I'm on YouTube live, and I got these fans asking me, you got to ask Greg, uh, why me on seasons three and four? That's what people want to know, and I know that's an early question into this thing, but what, people want to know why me, and I, me and you have talked, so maybe you want to tell everybody um, why me for season three and four. Well, I, I can't, I mean, I think it's sort of self-explanatory, but it might, it might be helpful for your listeners to know a little bit about our process of making that show. Um, there, are, there are a number of football shows and sports shows, um, but almost always, if, whether it's Hard Knocks or, um, you know, I think Amazon Prime was doing a series for a while. Uh, HBO Sports, they do a number of series and, in order to get the deal done, whether it's inside uh, the locker room of, uh, let's say, Gonzaga during their during a basketball season, or Florida State, or Notre Dame, or any of these high-profile Division One schools, or even an NFL team, um, it's very difficult to get both access and journalistic creative control, um, and. And I think it's even hard to do this at the junior college level. It's easier because I think when you're going to a junior college, they feel, uh, at least when you talk to their administration and you talk to their coaches, um, they, they understand there is a much bigger upside for them uh, than there is for like the Dallas Cowboys, for instance. It's not like I'm going to be introducing the world to the Dallas Cowboys. Sure. The world already, already knows the Dallas Cowboys, but, um, the world didn't know Independence Community College. Right. And um, so it, what was fun was we had a, a really good two-year run at East Mississippi. And we, and we spent two years in Scuba, Mississippi. We felt like uh, after that two years, we, we authentically documented that place. And that if we were to just stay there, we'd really just be repeating ourselves, which wouldn't have been a bad thing because there were two great seasons. We, you know, they, they're, that's a... Uh, a really interesting place and, and the quality of football that's played there it was really good for our show. Sure. But we thought, it, it, you know, you get just JB, you can appreciate this. You get, you just kind of get restless. Like, well, you want to know what else is out there and creatively you need things that were going to kind of inspire you. And the first two years of last chance you were spent at a place that was already an established winner. Uh, they had already won 
five national championships by the time we got there. And, um, and, and so we thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we went somewhere where they hadn't won before? And so we just started looking at schools and, um, a couple things jumped out at us at our, in our research. This is before we even met. Uh, there is, uh, you know, this, there's, there's these recruiting lists that will go out top 100 JUCO recruits. And if you are one of the top JUCOs in the country, you'll get two, maybe three guys off that top 100 list. And so I think Scuba, Mississippi, the year that we were filming them, they had one. Um, there's uh, Arizona Western, I think, had one or two. Um, you know, pick a high-profile JUCO program and – you know, you're, you're like, you're king of the hill. If you've got three, right. you're doing great. If you get one or two, Right. well, there was this one school in Kansas that we had never heard of that had nine, <laughs> nine of the 100. And as best as we could tell, they had never won a bowl game ever. Like, okay, how, what is this? And so we started doing some digging and we realized that they had had this new coach, brand new coach. Jason Brown was his name. None of us had ever heard of him. I thought, Ooh, well, let's, I mean, let's get him on the phone. Let's, the let's hell just is see this guy? Yeah. If, yeah, let's, let's meet him. And, you know, five minutes with you on the phone, we realized, oh man, this will be, he'd be great. <laughs> Jason, ever great. And there was two reasons that I thought you'd be great. One is you seem to be extremely comfortable speaking your mind. Um, and the reason why that's important is you, when you're a documentarian, you want as best you can to get somebody who's comfortable on camera to just be themselves. And that, and that could take several different shapes. You could be someone that's very shy, but you're comfortable in allowing that camera to document your shyness. You could be somebody that's bigger than life, but if you shrink when the camera's on, uh, it just feels inauthentic. Sure. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't quite work. So my sense in talking to you is that you'd be, perfectly comfortable on camera. Um, you'd also didn't know anything really about us. So you weren't doing it just to, you know, get famous because you, you really didn't know much about our show when you and I were talking. Yeah. I didn't even watch and, the first um, two at, at East Mississippi. I didn't even watch it. And my coaches were telling me, uh, about the show and I was too busy recruiting, working, building the program. So I was like, shit, I didn't care about what this was. And then when, when Chelsea called me, I'll never forget this day. Uh, Chelsea called, who's, uh, one of Greg's colleagues and work, uh, works for Greg. She reached out and was like, yes. we are in a staff meeting, Greg. And I don't know if I told you this story, but we were in a staff meeting. She calls, I went in my phone in my office and grabbed it. And I said, it rang a bell. I said, that's the show my coach has been telling me about. And I go, what do you need from me? And she was like, well, we would like to talk to you. And our producer would like to come down and see you. And I'm like, Ah, let me get back to you. I went into the office and I, I'm looking at a bunch of young coaches in the face and I'm sitting there like, you know what? I'm not interested at number one. Number two, I'm worried about the microphone, not the camera. I didn't give a shit about the camera, Greg. I cared about I knew the microphone was going to get my ass in trouble. So I said, you know what? Who am I to take away that opportunity from a bunch of young mostly black coaches let's say, let's say that and then a bunch of uh, opportunity for a bunch of other kids and i so I, I said you know what i'm willing to talk to whoever and and uh and that's what happened and then you guys came down for i think our spring game or something and went from there yeah yeah we came down met you in the spring um and the second thing that persuaded me that that was the place we wanted to go was uh your complete trust in us to come and authentically tell the story of your program. And uh, you had a, a president that was totally on board. You know, he, he walked me through, Hey, here are my questions. We answered all those questions right. and, um, and then just looked us in the face said, all right, listen, I'm in if you're in. And uh, I just felt like, it was a, a great match. It was a place you were our number one choice. You were, you were where we, we had about four or five schools we were talking to. You were my number one choice. And, and I could feel that, that you guys 
not only would you tolerate us there, but that you kind of wanted us there. And that, and it just made a good fit. Yeah. Cause Tammy was so great. And you know how Tammy was, even though I know you like her on camera a little more, I always mess with her on that, but she, she was the perfect, you know, uh, she kind of eliminated a lot of the, uh, gray area talk. She kind of stayed in her lane, but at the same time, she was always professional. She didn't care about the cameras, but she was still about the college, the kids and the coaches and, and her program. So she couldn't have been a better one. I know she would have liked, you would have liked her on camera more. See maybe me too. I mean, um, but I know she had a job to do. I know she wanted to do that job and it's just unfortunate after the whole debacle as, after I left, everybody's kind of gone now and it's a whole new place. So, um, well, she was the only she was the only female athletic director in the, yeah. in the Jayhawk conference. Yeah, one of the most storied athletic <laughs> conferences in all the country. I mean, yeah. it, 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 if you're in terms of overall junior college sports, you're you're not going to find it's going to you're going to be hard pressed yeah. finding a better conference than the Jayhawk. No and doubt. so I can imagine I I I I, I lamented I, I just I was so frustrated that I could not get her to be uh, more candid and more present on the cameras. But she was the only woman athletic director. And I think she felt like mm -hmm. she had to be more careful and yeah. more conservative than your average athletic director. I, I have nothing but respect for Tammy. I, I loved her to death. What, a, what an incredible person. Yeah, she's, man, no doubt. She's in the Hall of Fame at Kansas State, one of the best. Yep. I mean, why, am I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. No. She's one of the greatest her, her, she female hangs basketball the banner. players of all time, right? Yeah. 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 Olympian, yeah. And, I mean, you uh, can't name her. 84 Olympics. She's been part of everything. So, I mean, like, you know, she's she is a, uh, you know, Kansas State lore. Like, people revere uh, her uh, out there. So, it's just, uh, it's one of those deals, but. Now, nah, you know, I we all like appreciate you, it. You and her made a good team. Yeah, we did. I think, you know, she's like I said, I've had I've had three great ADs or bosses. Let me just say it like that. I've had two great ADs. Um, buddy of mine, lefty at Compton College, who was one of the great. He's been he's been doing it a long time. And then um, my doctor Mendoza, who was my principal at Long Beach Cabrillo, who was basically the AD. And then um, and then. Um, and then I had Tammy, obviously. And then, you know, the people that get, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an old adage out there, man. Like people, you either get it, whatever it is, or you don't. That's just like having that it factor or you don't have it. Um, Tom Brady has it. Um, Bill Belichick has it. Um, you know, those three people I mentioned had it. And so, um, I think they'd say the same thing about me. I know we've talked about it, not to boast, but I think we both had it and we, we got it. We got it. We had it. And we understood what it what it took. And that was what makes, I think, great uh, relationships and where you can, you know, build things. And whether it's a football program or a damn Fortune 500 business, I don't care. I think it all has to kind of mesh into some type of uh, semblance, you know. So I don't know. But you had a great run, uh, Greg. I know we'll get into it. But I wanted to tell you this before we get into it. Like since meeting you and having built a pretty good relationship, I admire your you're outside the box thinking. And I thought you did great for not only for not really knowing the Juco demographic. I don't know if the fans out there understand um, the dynamic that comes with Juco, because as you know, now, obviously there's tons of moving parts to this Juco business and not only in football, but I'm sure you found with cheer and basketball, uh, nothing is easy with Juco framework. And it's probably allows you to sleep pretty well at night, knowing you put your best foot forward and, and did great things that allowed millions of families to enjoy in the comfort of their own homes. Uh, would you say that's accurate? Yeah. It's, I, 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 yes, it is millions. That is, I, I can verify that that is literally true. Millions <laughs> of people have seen your face no doubt. And, 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 and junior college football. And, it, and so there's an interesting, there was an interesting poll that was taken after the second season of last chance year where, you know, we'd only been to one school and the poll was, um, most I'm trying to remember what the phrase was. I want to say it was most popular college football brand. Mm. So you're not necessarily arguing in this poll. What is the best team of all time? Who's the best team currently? It's what's the most, what's the most iconic. I think it was iconic. What's the most iconic brand. And um, uh, number three on that top 20 list, number three, 
our most iconic college football brand was East Mississippi Community College. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, after we did the show with you, I was, I was wearing some uh, independence pirate apparel hmm. uh, in Amsterdam, of all places. Wow. And I got stopped by people in Amsterdam who were saying, oh, this is my favorite show, my favorite show, JB, JB. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, it's crazy. I, I, yeah. It's a tribute, I think, to the popularity of the show, but it's also a tribute to the global reach of Netflix. That, that platform is sure. just like nothing else. It's just millions of subscribers in 36 different countries. And yeah, I, um, now, millions of people have seen you and the show. Oh, man. And, you know, Greg, every time I take a program, I always come up with a, you know, a trigger line that's, that's going to get. And it's it was always for recruiting and, you know, pushing the, the brand, pushing the uh, to, for the for the kids to see it and, and come. And so when I got the job, we hired coaches. I I was on their ass about we're going to hit social media hard. We're going to be trending. I think we were trending on Twitter at one point on our first year at Indy. Because yeah. we were on social yeah. media so hard recruiting, and I and I and that's you know my my staff meetings were three times a day during that first year, and it was all recruiting, and and I was teaching young coaches how to recruit. I was teaching uh, even older coaches. This is what we got to do. And so when I created the phrase "Dream You," um, you know, I, I I had different phrases at Compton College, Cabrillo. I had I've always used "Win," what's important now, but I also I always had uh, some that fit that particular college. So I kind of took the you from last chance you that you created. And then I started, I I said, you know what? I want to make sure that this is a place that everybody's dreams come true. We're going to bring guys in, call it dream you. And, uh, you know, a guy on YouTube just, you know, put, put up their dream. You is the most iconic brand, but you know, that's what we kind of shot for. That's what we were aiming for. We wanted to get that going. And like you say, you go to Amsterdam and it's amazing. I can't go to Walmart. I can't go to, I can't go anywhere, man. And, and it's like, I was with my mom, Greg, you'll find this funny. You know, my mom, I was with her. We're, we're walking around uh, living spaces of all places. And I'm walking from the store to my car and a truck drives by and is like, Coach AB. And my mom's like, how the hell do you know who he is? And she goes, <laughs> the, the guy goes, because his walk. I know his walk. <laughs> I was like, geez, oh, Christ. I said, wow. So that's that's a testament to you, Greg. I know you created this thing from from basically going on a magazine to 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 doing this, and and uh, you know, I know the folks listening want to know why why has it why does it have to come to an end now? Has it run its course, or is it on to bigger and better things with the football avenue? Uh, was it a Netflix decision or yours? Um, I know unscripted material is not the best paying. TV, but why, why now? I guess people want to know, um, no more football. Is it, was it just a unilateral decision or was it, um, uh, you, or was it just, it's time to go on like it was for me and Indy? <laughs> well, I, I think ultimately, uh, you know, whether I wanted to do the show, continue doing the show or not, uh, Netflix owns the rights to the show and they could do it forever if they chose. Uh, and I think, I think they just decided, Hey, five years, uh, of doing football, um, maybe that's a, the the show continues to be as popular as it ever has been. Right. But I I think they're just I think they'd like to just try some other things, and and I'm game. I'm mm-hmm. I'm game to try some other things as well. Sure. And so I know you did cheer. Uh, I know that had to be different. Um, and I know you told me before there are some tough SOBs that that you filmed there. Um, and I believe it. Trust me. I know there's some hard asses there. Uh. How was it similar, and how did it differ from football and basketball? You mean cheer as yeah. opposed to football? Yeah, just yeah. filming it and being around it. I know that's, that was another highly watched show. I actually watched it um, at all, Greg, and I thought it was it was filmed great uh, as normal as as expected. And I just thought it was a really unique uh, space. So, um, you know, was it just a completely different ball game, or is it the same thing because it's JUCO and you still have the same everyday struggles trying to appease everybody in juco who talk behind suck our teeth you know how juco people get and so is it the same was it the same struggle or is it just a completely different animal well in some ways it's similar um like if you were to if you were to sit me down and and say you know before we'd film cheer and just say look what what makes 
what makes JUCO football players so gritty? Mm-hmm. And you would say, well, it, it, it's one, it's in part, uh, they're, uh, a lot of times they're coming from tough backgrounds in which they've had to survive some very difficult things. And that's going to make you tough. It's going to make you gritty. Um, you're also, if you're at a junior college and you're a bounce back, you sort of feel like your back is against the wall. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that, that sort of urgency, as you know, um, people respond to it differently. But the players that rise to that occasion and come out swinging because they know it's their last shot and they're fighting for their football lives, um, that produces a kind of intensity that I think has been the hallmark of that show. So if you were to tell me, well, Greg, why don't you, you're going to go now and film uh, a group of athletes where they have zero prospect of moving on past uh, their junior college to play their respective sport. There is no potential for a payday in that sport. There's no such thing as professional cheerleading in that way. You know, there's, There's professional cheerleaders, but it, it's not yeah, the same thing. Right. They're, they're, um, they're, they're like group, they're I, like uh, club sports. Yes. Uh, well, I would just would have assumed that, the, that it would be less intense. And it was every bit as intense, mm-hmm. uh, if not more so. Uh, and it, to make it even more strange, JB, there is no competitions week in and week out except for one at the end of the year. And so you think, well, is it hard for this head coach to keep the right. team's focus? I mean, I remember you, how nervous you were just during a bye week. No I mean, doubt. you guys have got 11 games in a season in which you can, <laughs> you can hang playing time over their head. You could threaten to bench them, and Hell that yeah. would get their attention. That was a way of keeping them focused. But during a bye week, you would like – I just remember you were, you were as nervous as a – as a cat, uh, what am I going to do? These players, how do I keep their attention during this bye week? What, yeah. what are they going to do? You got to win well, bye imagine, weeks. Yeah. <laughs> imagine every week is a bye week right. except for one game Oof. at the end of the season. Shit. So I just think their coach, Monica Aldama, and, and the types of cheerleaders, right. it just kind of goes to show you that, and I'm sure this is true. I suspect it's even true of the football players that you and I know. That's not what's truly motivating them deep down, this payday or right. uh, the fact that they may move on. There is a sort of competitive gear that some people have, and these cheerleaders had it. Yeah, that's that's just another – I mean, I, like I know you're the most humble guy I know probably, Greg. So what – like you got Monica, myself. Uh, Buddy probably chose not to do it um, as far as using other – streaming avenues as far as trying to go out and, and, and create their brand. But um, we'll see what the new coach, I don't know his name, Beam, I believe. So what, what, coach Beam. yeah. So like, you know, I, I've seen Monica on TV on national stages, the Ellen show. I mean, you name it. That's all because of you. So like people always ask me, you know, uh, uh, you know, I get this question all the time. W- was I depicted in a correct manner? And I always answer the same, Greg. <clears throat> I always say, you know, Greg Whiteley and his team did a great job and he knew what he knew. And that, what I say by that, and Greg's heard me say that a million times to my players, but we only know what we know and I don't care what space it is, but Greg was coming to this Juco world. He's already been in there for two years and it's probably a completely different dynamic for him. And, you know, when you're new to the Juco lifestyle and I tell people all the time how a high school diploma, a college degree to me is the single most overrated piece of paper ever printed on. And to to me, this world we live in is a hands-on experience based life that we live. And it's not based on intellect and how many degrees one has, but having said that you, you were learning on the job, so to speak, I'm I'm sure on the first two years when it comes to JUCO, not your profession, obviously you're the great, you're great at what you do and you've been great at it, obviously to do it. And you're a true professional, but you know, an Emmy is something one could only dream of getting into the business for, I'm sure. And, you know, what's your response to the fans that says, oh, JB wasn't depicted right? Because I tell them all the time. I said, listen, he filmed me on thousands of hours. And I said, they only have so many things they can get on. And, you know, I know there was 16 hours to use thousands of film on, to be fair, um, to Greg, for everyone out there that doesn't understand it. So I tell people every day, I accepted it. I blame nobody. I, I know you would have never have screwed me or, 
or did anything to me on purpose. I, I, I am a good judge of character and I knew you had a great heart and everyone wanted to, you wanted everyone to succeed. And, and let's be honest, fans and everybody out there without Greg, I'm just going to be telling you guys without the show, I wouldn't have had a number one best selling book. I wouldn't have a whiskey and cigar line, nor would I have had several other opportunities that presented itself without you, Greg, and the show. So that, that is the positives. And, and one could say the negative is that I was on one of the most watched Netflix shows and maybe I'll never coach again or be looked at in the profession the same way after the show. Who knows? I mean, it is what it is. It was a fun ride. Uh, I still affected more lives than the average professional or human will in their job. And, and so what can I do? I, I cannot look back because I'm not going that way. And I've been saying that I'm not going to ever look back because I'm never going to go back that way. And so, you know, I don't know what your take is on, on it, but, you know, uh, it is what it is. I mean, I accepted it. I got big boy shoulders and I told those coaches the same thing. And, you know, we got 13 coaches, division one jobs. Eight of them were unpaid for all the guys that were bitching and moaning. So, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And like, I'll never blame anyone for my, you know, I'm a grown person and life's about choices, Greg, as you know, and we all make them and we either make bad ones or good ones. And so, you know, I, I think you did what you're supposed to do. Um, and, and everyone asked, I, I would love to have more Nick Sabins and coaches coming in talking to how, how the kids were and how they well behaved and, and, but maybe that's not what you filmed because you saw them smoking and doing crazy shit. I don't know, but you know what I mean? So it would have made me look better, but that's not necessarily the, the correct way that you have to do it as a professional. Cause I don't know your job and don't judge it just like you didn't know mine. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that I got all these grown people that judge me every day and hate on me, but it is what it is. Well, so a couple things, you're, you're being very generous with me. I, <laughs> um, I take issue with two things that you said. First, you know that I'm standing on the shoulders of a whole team of people. You, you mentioned this crew. I had a, a great crew in Indy, yeah. uh, starting with Terry Zomolt, the cinematographer. Um, there was uh, Luke Lorenzen, who was a, a fellow director in there. And um, for a season, we had a uh, talented both an editor and a field producer, producer Adam Ridley. Um, I could go on down the line. I mean, they, I've had, uh, I, I've been given, I've had an embarrassment of riches in terms of the level of talent around me to make these shows. And that would include cheer too. I could list you a whole bunch of names. You mentioned one of them, Chelsea Arnell, sure. who, um, you know, and, and so, you know, it's a whole team that's, that's producing these shows, but everybody that's a member of my team, would say their job is to shoot what's in front of them and document that story as accurately as they possibly can in the most entertaining way possible. Those are the, those are the two uh, mandates, be honest and be entertaining. And, and sometimes those two things will come into conflict and the one that has to win out is, is authenticity, honesty. You can't, you can't catch that now. Uh, so it, listen, it, Monica Aldama is going to be on Dances with the Stars. She was on Ellen. She's mm -hmm. um, got a Hollywood agent. You've got a cigar line and a whiskey line. And I, I, there's no way I could take credit for that. All I did was show the world who you guys were, or at least a snapshot of who you were. And I'll get to that in a second. But you know, as many people as are hating on you, JB. There's, I happen to know firsthand there's a whole world of people out there that love you. They think you're, they think you're great. Uh, and I'm one of them. I think you're great. Um, and uh, so I, I think that it's, a, it's such a privilege to go to a new place, whether it's Scuba, Mississippi, Independence Community College or Corsicana, Texas or Oakland, California. It is a great honor and a privilege to have somebody open up their life, their program, and then the kids that are associated, they open up their lives and it's a great responsibility. Uh, and we're not perfect. We just do everything we can to try and satisfy those due demands. Let's, let's, uh, the phrase that we use is let's, let's shoot these people with a cold eye, but a warm heart. Mm -hmm. Let's try and shoot them in a way that if it were reversed, 
we would want them to be shooting us in the same way. That's how I want to do it. I, I, I don't want to exploit anybody's frailties. I don't want to take anybody's sayings or uh, moments and, 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 and goose them out of context to exploit it for dramatic purposes because I personally feel the show benefits from resisting those temptations of picking the low-hanging fruit and instead trying to tell a more complex story. We don't always get it right because, you know, as, as much as we shoot, and JB, you were one of the great ones because there was not a single thing you did not let us film. There was not a single request that we made that you said, yeah, no, I, that, that is on limits. I told you, anything you want to film, you could film. And, and that's, that's rare. Uh, but even still, even of those hundreds of hours that we shot with you, um, we're still only with you for three months. You've lived a long time. You're a grown man. There's a huge part of your life that even as, as well as you and I know each other, there's still a huge part of your life that I just don't have, I didn't have time to get to, to document, to access, to understand. And so all we are giving viewers is really a snapshot of someone. And um, you just, during that time that you're allowed to film someone, you just give it your best shot. I just do the best I can to tell it as authentically as I can in the most entertaining way possible. And you, you just don't always get it right. Here's one thing that I wish I had more time for. I think in my five years of filming junior college football programs, you came the closest to articulating how I eventually came to feel about education, particularly higher education, and most particularly higher education among quote-unquote student athletes. You were the very first to point out that it's a bit of a sham. And I wish that I had more time to properly document what that means, because I think people, I think you caught a lot of heat for, for calling out higher education among student athletes, among football players in particular. Uh, and I wish that they understood what you were really trying to say. And I tried as best I could to figure it out, but then it, it becomes a much different documentary. You, I could do a sure. six part series on <laughs> educating college athletes, but look, you can, you can edit this podcast, however you want to edit it. But let me, let me say what I think you were trying to teach me when I was there, because I've spent a lot of time thinking about it since I've been with you. And I, 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 I think I've come around. I'm, I'm, I'm aligned with your thinking. And here's my sense. I think if you could go back in the 1940s and fifties, when, you know, the golden age of college football, you could, you could offer an athlete, you could offer them this, this deal. You come play football at this school and we're going to give you an education for free. And back in those early days, you know, college football wasn't nothing. You still had people showing up to games on Saturday and you could charge admission, but there wasn't the TV contracts, the merchandise sales, the, the types of booster support you get by having a number one college football team. It right. wasn't as lucrative, in other words. Right. But, so back then, it, that was a pretty good trade. The biggest factor, and the reason why that truly was a fair trade back then, was the demands on the football player's time during the week was not as intense as it is today. If you go to the University of Alabama and play for Coach Saban, you are majoring and minoring in football. I don't care what your declared major is. You are majoring there in football. You are hoping against hope. You are competing against a ton of other athletes. Like what? How many scholars at college? How many scholarship athletes at, at University of Alabama? Is it 80 something? Well, just and, on football, it's 85, but you're talking about all the other sports and mixing in Title IX and all that stuff. You know, you're, you're, you're into the 500 athlete range or, or more. Yeah, well, let's just take football, and I think you could probably loop in basketball. You could probably make an argument for some other sports as well, but those are the two revenue-bearing sports, and as such, your time while you're there at Alabama, and I'm not just talking about your time during the football season. I'm talking about your time full-time at Alabama. Your full-time job is being a football player. You have very little time to actually be an authentic student, and what I mean by that is, Let's juxtapose 
the football players that you and I both know that go on and play at division one colleges. And they're, they're presumably, you know, trading, they're playing for free right. and they're making, you know, they're, they're exchanging that for this education. For me, when I went and I was an undergraduate at Brigham Young University, I uh, spent hours talking to these two film professors that I became close to. Those conversations that I had, those, those late nights spent, you know, working on a film that had nothing to do with my coursework or spending weekends um, helping other friends with their films that had nothing to do. It was completely outside of class. But they were people that were in my major. We were talking all the time. We were trying to apply these theories that we had learned in class into these new ways of making movies. And that was, that was my education. Just sitting in class and taking a multiple choice test I don't even think about those things anymore, let alone their influence is so small. It had nothing to do with the type of thinker I am today, but, but just being able to rub shoulders with great men and women who were both faculty members and my fellow students outside of class where I truly could apply in a, in a, in a way that was, that was consistent with the passion that was beginning to develop within me and going to this school. If you're a college football player, you can't do any of that. You go to class, you take the test, and then the rest of the time is spent lifting weights, team meetings, practice, or recovering from mm-hmm. lifting weights, team meetings, and practice. And it's just not a fair trade. And so I feel like, I think, I think an interesting study would be go to these kids and um, all of these kids that have graduated from University of Alabama. And I don't want to pick on the University of Alabama because I don't, I don't think, I think Nick Sagan is, Nick Saban is, is doing what he is being paid to do. Right. He's being, he, he graduates his kids and he wins more football games yep. than anybody else. Yep. And, and that's his job. I don't, think it's, I don't think it should fall at his feet to fix this problem. I think it's a much bigger problem. Mm-hmm. And, and I, there, I think there's some creative ways to fix it, too. One way, I, I, I don't know that this is true, but I've heard that John Calipari has made an offer that, look, you come and play basketball for me. You're going to be essentially majoring in basketball while you're here. I'm going to do the best I can to get you to the NBA or yeah. somewhere in the world that's going to pay you for your talent. Yep. And if and when that doesn't work out, if and when your playing days are done, you can come back and take classes for free at the University of Kentucky. I think that kind of makes sense. I, 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 I don't know what kind of rules, what, what, what sort of stipulations in their way, but I, I think – the Board of Regents, people that are in charge of college football and college basketball, those revenue-bearing sports, I think they should get in a room and figure this out. I love college football as much as the next guy. I love college basketball as much as the next person. But so I don't want to see it destroyed. But I don't think we can. I don't think we can keep exploiting this young talent. And, and by the way, it's a it's a demographic of people <laughs> that can least afford to be exploited right now. Yeah. And. Um, uh, I, I think, I, I think if people had a better understanding of of what it is that you were saying when you were mentioning that on the show, I think they'd be sympathetic too. And you know what? Shame on anybody who sits at home enjoying college football and is not being sensitive to this issue. You are, you are enjoying it at the expense. Yeah. of Hypocrite. a group of lives that can least afford to pay it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's seventy percent. Uh, black played sport right now and you know uh like i said i you know i was going to ask you um earlier but i was going to say you know I, i've been taking heat just on saying it's taking the Dabo sweeney's the nick savings the chip kelly's the usc the clay helton's they took a week or longer to make a statement when the whole george floyd issue happened when everybody was coming out and to me it's like Pete Carroll, and I'm cut from that cloth, but I know Pete would have did it because he's done it, and and this is what I used to do growing up in Compton and being at Compton College with a guy, Coach Ward. We would have had the team in our sweatsuits, and we would have been walking down Figueroa, and that would have yeah. happened that day, not a week later with a PR statement that comes from my publicist. This would have happened that day. And that's what me- separates the recruiters from the great recruiters because the great recruiters – will always out-recruit a guy who's just trying to 
improve your game. The great recruiters improve your life. And that's just something me and Damon Stoudemire were talking about the other day when we were mentioning Lute Olson that he played for and a good friend of mine did. But, you know, I used to try to tell those kids, and that's why I think I got those kids from those other schools. And I've done this for so long with the, getting those kids because I was going to change their life. And I think they knew it, they trusted it, and they believed it. And I told the parent the same thing. But it just is a slap in the face to me, Greg, when you go into a home and you tell this predominantly black mother single black mother that you're going to you're going to take care of this kid you're going to get his graduated you're going to make sure he does right and give me your blessing mom that i can smack him across the head no pun intended but i'm gonna put my foot in his butt if he screws up and i never had an issue with a parent coming to me talking about i was too hard on them that's what the people i don't think understood from the show I never had a parent come at me. Every parent I ever had was, except if you were obviously a shit bird, which everyone knows, those are the kids and the parents that are, are the problems, the ones that don't make it. The ones that make it, though, are the ones that parents said, yep, coach, take them. And you, 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 you're daddy on campus. And that's what it was. And the kids that accepted that, um, and not in that degrading way, but in uh, the kids that accepted it were the ones that succeeded. And the ones that didn't were still in at Walmart and – uh, got cut, and then they were the ones coach hated on me, and you know that type of shit, and that happens at every level. And I told you, Greg, I think before, if I were the commissioner of the of of college football, which I think college football needs a commissioner, that's why it's so in turmoil right now. Uh, I've been saying this for years, but if I was the commissioner, I would make every single high school kid go to JUCO for at least a semester. Whether they played or they didn't play, I bet you dollars to dimes, you would have less domestic violence. You would have less issues in class. You would have less issues. And let me rephrase it. It's, it's hard to say any JUCO. But let me just say, if you played at my JUCO or came to my JUCO, this is what I would want. Because I would teach you to sit in the front row take notes, how to be respectable in class with your teachers, how to work hard, be the first one up, last one to go to bed, et cetera, et cetera, because at the next level, until, uh, unfortunately, Emmett Gooden, being my first kid had ever been kicked out of a four-year school, and that just happened, um, and I love Emmett to death, and, 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 and that's a whole other story, but that was my first kid out of 227 that's ever been kicked out of a four-year school, and that, that probably bugs me. Every night when I go to sleep, more than any loss or victory, loss, anything that I've ever had. And that's what people don't get. And, uh, you know, that's what the shit pisses me off because I'm just like, these are the things that train those guys. Because they, all, they go right out of high school. Who, let's be frank. They, they don't learn anything from the education. I mean, we're teaching history that didn't even happen. So, number one. They don't learn anything. And then guess what? The coaches are kissing their asses to keep them at the high school from transferring. Let's be honest. It's the highest transfer. Really, Henry played at four high schools. I mean, let's be honest. That's what the new age kid is doing. And so those kids, those coaches are worried about keeping the kid instead of coaching the kid. And that puts a huge burden on these kids. And then the parent has no clue. She's either a single mother with four or five or six kids, who knows, working two jobs, gets home late. The kid's already thrown an eraser at the teacher, disrespect three adults, and the mother has no clue about it. And guess what? If, you, if your dog piss, pisses on your rug and you don't rub his nose in it, guess what? He does it again tomorrow. So, like, my, my whole point is, like, you know, I think – we allow it or we coach it. And I think we've been allowing it for a long time. And, and I think it's the kids. Uh, it's not the kids fault. It's the coaches and the parents. And then that, that's what's happening. The parent, the coaches are, you know, continue to kiss their butt. And guess what happens, Greg? The kid goes to the Taj Mahal, Alabama, and has been told lies his whole high school career because the coach was kissing his butt. And then boom, the real world hits him in the mouth and he gets uh, sized up with guys good or better than him. And now he all of a sudden don't want to compete and transfers, boom, and drops a tweet that says, I will be going to opening my options or whatever these soft tweets are about, um, you know, how just how entitled we've become, man. And that's just what it is. And these kids are, you know, they, 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 uh, they want instant gratification and, and, and they want these, uh, they want them to kiss their ass. And that's, that's just what happens. And so, 
you know, if they came to JUCO, though, they'd get hit in the mouth with the real world right out the gate instead of going to see the Taj Mahal at Alabama and thinking that all the shit is just good and clean and nice when it's really not. You need to come to JUCO for a year, get your ass uh, tough skin developed, and then you go to Alabama and you won't get kicked out semester one. Um, not saying Alabama has players kicked out. They do. Everyone does. But wherever you go, um, I think you would, you, would, you would be able to sustain um, – the the uh, you know the grit and the grind and, and understanding what it takes to be a student athlete and and a little bit different a black student athlete and I just am ashamed these coaches man tell these parents these lies in the, in the home and uh, not to rant on but um, you know and then and then they don't even make a statement when something globally is happening and they don't even make a statement without a PR and it takes a week to me that's just uh it's not sincere and if you're a real sincere recruiter and you told your parents that. You could, you could, I'd get online right now and do a damn speech, um, you know, without having to write it out. So I don't know. I, I think, I mean, there's a lot to unpack. You, you know, a lot more about, I mean, you've just, I mean, what, what number would you put on it? And you've probably coached, I don't know, 2000 kids during the course of your yeah, thousand at least, least. Yeah. At least a thousand, 2000 come in contact with you figure set 18 years of, you know, shoot, usually you have 100 kids a year at least. That That's just who's on your team. That's not who you interact and help, you know. Well, let's say you line up – let's say it's a 1,000, probably more than that, but let's say you lined up all 1,000 kids that you coached. Um, and I'm not even talking about just the ones who started for you. Right. I'm talking about everyone who has come and has agreed to come play for your football team. How many of them – when, if you were to sit them down and ask them, um, how many of them would say that they are, well, I guess it's two parts. How many of them, JB, would say that their career goal is to play in the NFL? How many of them believed they would actually play in the NFL out of a thousand? A thousand, both ways. A thousand would believe that they play in the NFL and that they want to. I mean, that's, that's, it's unbelievable. And to answer your question, to help, to, to tell everybody what you're kind of getting to, I was the asshole. I took the label of being the asshole when I used to bring kids in and say, son, you will not play division one football. If this was when I was a high school coach, you cannot go division one. You just are not good enough or you're not big enough. You're not fast enough. You don't, you don't have what they're looking for. And then they look at you and they think you're an asshole, but really in reality it's the truth and I'd rather tell you the truth than have a kid get set up to fail and leave me. And then guess what he starts doing? He starts sucking his teeth like a couple kids I've had do because I told him they weren't good enough. And then all oh, coaches hating. I don't get a scholarship, son. If you were good enough, they would have offered you. I mean, that's just what it is. There's no gray area. You're either good enough or you're not. You, you graduate or you don't. You, you win or you lose. I mean, there's no gray area. So, but to answer your question, a thousand. So it, it's, it, I think that there is a temptation to say, well, these, these thousand kids are just delusional. Um, and maybe some of them are, maybe some of them just do not have that talent and they fool themselves. But here's what I know is that the handful of people that have matriculated through our show that have ended up in the NFL I think if they're being honest, um, they they have they have gotten lucky in addition to working incredibly hard and being incredibly physically gifted. They've had some things kind of fall their way because you and I both know of people that were incredibly gifted, incredibly talented and hardworking, and it just didn't work out for them. Um, I, I, the point I'm trying to make is I think it's okay to be somewhat delusional and to have that dream sure. uh, when you're that, when you're that young, because I think it is very difficult to predict who is going to make it and who isn't. So who am I to tell you? I mean, I, you're in a much better position coach than me to tell someone, uh, Hey, I don't know if you really have it or not, sure. but I am happy. I'm happy to help someone achieve their dreams. But what I'd like to see us do is I think these universities 
are magical places. They are a strange collection of talent and genius. You can, at, at any university, um, doesn't even have to be from a power five. You go to any university and you're going to find, in, you know, at, the four, at a four-year school, you're going to find a Nobel laureate. You'll find somebody that uh, uh. has um, a, a published uh, meaningful work in the field of biology or chemistry. Um, and when you're an 18 year old kid, if you're trying to be an NFL player, if you're, unless your focus is solely on being an NFL player, you're not going to make it. So I don't think we should blame these kids for quote unquote, neglecting their education while they're at these four year schools. It's just so hard to truly take advantage of everything a university has to offer when you are working full time to pursue your dream. At, at, so I just think we've got to figure that out. Why, yeah. why can't why can't we let kids come back when their playing days are done or it didn't work out, and and there is a there is an apparatus in place to kind of help ease them back into the transition of college life and truly take advantage of what a university has to offer? Because my gosh, I mean, you and I both know what happens to these kids when their playing days are done. It's not a good story. No, and and it, and even to take it further, <clears throat> Nick Saban makes nine plus million dollars a year. That's just what we know, and that's not incentives or anything, <clears throat> and that's not what side right. money boosters are giving them. So, how much do you think the president in Alabama makes? Three, four hundred grand, maybe. I don't know. I'm just I'm just spitballing. Maybe it, half it, a million, I, maybe. I, 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 well, there was an article last week in the Athletic that broke down every president's salary as best as they knew you know stanford is a private institution so they don't know for sure right. but the, but the, and they don't know usc's but they know ucla's and they know right. oregon states and oregon's etc so it's everyone is making you know and at least in that conference they're making somewhere between six hundred thousand to a million dollars a year okay um and alabama i suspect it's the same i bet you it's right in there so a million so dollars can, that's a public school you can find that out yeah so a million yeah. dollars let's just say a million even two million, Greg. It doesn't matter. You're not even close to making what Nick Saban makes. Not even close. Like percentage wise, you're not even in the same, um, you know, ballpark as far as what it is. So that tells you where the what matters. And people argue me all the time. Like, oh, it's about the school and the education. No, it's not. There's not a hundred thousand people coming to watch a math exam. Just we've already talked about this before. There's not. Science teachers are not recruiting new bodies to the campuses. That's what people don't get. The science teachers are teaching the people who recruit the campus and bring those kids to campus, such as the football program. And people forget, okay, it's 85 scholarships and the coaches do make more money than gods. And um, those kids are treated different. They get preferential treatment because of what they do do. In a, in, a, in a sense. So, you know, you'd say these kids, but people forget there's 85 scholarships. There's also another 30 to 40 kids that walk on that pay out of their pocket. That also goes into that revenue stream. And people don't understand that same with basketball. They may have 10 walk-ons. I don't know, but you, you're going to get walk-on monies as well. And it's still football. You don't get walk-on money to go take a science class. Those kids are all granted financial aid, uh, paying out their own pocket, rich daddy, whatever you want to say. If you're at a place like Stanford, Cal, even UCLA, um, uh, or I mean USC, sorry, USC. They used to say back in the day, you could be dumb and, 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 and a freakish athlete and get into USC. You had to be smart um, and, and horrible athlete to get into UCLA. That was an old funny saying back in the day. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy, Greg. I mean, you know, there is some things that merit to it all. I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I do think that the, the diploma and high school diploma and college degree are the most uh, waste of ink we ever print on any type of paper. And I just think you'd learn by hands-on uh, experience-based things. Because, I, I mean, I think we need more trade, teaching trade and entrepreneurship out there instead of, you know, just these meaningless degrees that we get. Because, um, you know, and it, you know, I know you filmed a lot of those teachers in, in, in Indy and in East Mississippi and all these things. And you know how I feel about those without saying anything. But like I had a teacher tell my 
me, my, me that Emmett Gooden didn't know how to take notes and he'll, he won't pass my class. And I said, well, Emmett Gooden can sign a contract and pay his millions of dollars and take care of his family for life by signing his name on a contract. And unfortunately he may not, he may read at a three grade, third grade level, but it's your job to teach him how to take notes. Isn't it? Because the last I heard fucking Richard Sherman didn't know how to backpedal either until, you know, coach Donerson taught him. So like, it blows my mind what these actual teachers in these commuter schools or any educational institution really think about those kids and, and have no, no clue about where they come from or what it, what they, uh, come through to uh to try to get somewhere they couldn't get themselves and i try to tell people the definition of a coach and a teacher should be get you where you could not get yourself but i don't know um i don't want to hold you all day but keeping keeping it moving greg what what if anything would you put in the show that you think uh you could have that you filmed or even that you couldn't film that maybe you saw something um and you were like wish i could have had that is there anything that sticks out to you um i know i thought you I like personally, people ask me all the time and I, I, I thought maybe people that don't know, you know, Greg films a lot. OK, he films a lot of things that you never see. And I bet you I, I know I asked Greg one day when I was watching the first few snippets of the first season of me and I called Greg and I go, Greg, I thought you said I look good. And you go, well, if I would have if I wouldn't have if I would show everything I cut out, you'd be uh, you'd be in trouble. I go, shit. All right. Thank Thank you, sir. That's exactly what I told <laughs> uh greg on the on the phone one day when uh, me and tammy were watching it to get ahead pr wise uh but anyway nobody knows that story but you know i thought you would have used the me and michael rapaport for everybody that don't know me and michael rapaport went to a bar in hollywood and we were discussing everything after i resigned and from independence and Mike's a, a Jewish descent guy, and, and uh, our president was a Jewish descent, Dr. Barwick at the time. And, you know, you all know about the German issue and all that, the whole thing with the kid. Well, Michael Rapport had his own thought about the thing and was pretty pissed off and cussing out the kid and all that. I thought maybe that would have been put on or, or me and Rapport sitting there having a drink. But, you know, what makes you not put stuff like that on over like, you know, um, just a kid walking down the street. I mean, it's just because it's more relative and it's about the kid or um, it just doesn't fit in the, into the uh, flow. Well, it's, it, that's, that's a good way to put it. The second phrase is what's true. And the way I would articulate it is this. There is, uh, I think in, in the six to eight episode season, you can focus on about somewhere between four and six main characters right you can have four or six people that you really get to know who they were before they came to the institution before they came to the program and you really spend an unusual amount of time with that handful of people you know you were one of them uh the the years that we were there i mean people would know can figure out who those main characters are and you kind of have to choose them pretty early on Quickly, in the process. Yeah, yeah you have yep you, you have to pick them the first week because the season moves pretty fast and we always, we took great pride in being a show that would, would go deep, but maybe not wide. So what I mean by that sure. is we could, we could film 30 players. We could focus on, sure. focus on 30 different people, but you couldn't go deep with any one of them. And we just don't think that makes for a very interesting show. Sure. Well, so the moment you select, you know, between four and six as your main character, um, you, you just become absolutely obsessed with, well, what is their story? And so every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you have to find that arc for each one of them. And then the scenes that end up making it into the show, almost without exception, there are some exceptions, but every scene is moving one of those four to six stories forward. Sure. And if it isn't, you really have to be judicious. Like, well, do we really need that scene? Because it may seem like six hours or eight hours of content is a long time, but it's really not. And, and, you know, each episode we are leaving out amazing scenes because as you said, it just in going with the flow and of telling the story with a beginning, middle and end. And one, one scene builds on another scene, then builds on another scene. And then there's a climax that kind of brings it all together. 
you just have to in the in the in the industry if the phrase we use you just have to kill your babies <laughs> there's some there's some scenes oh, you love right. and you just gotta you know it's yeah. It's like a football. It's like a it football is. coach Cutting. trying to make, decide yeah. the starting lineup. Like, yeah. okay, you know, I know you're great, but this yeah. guy ahead of you, I just, you know, there's a certain chemistry when he's on the field, and I can't explain it, but that's who we're going with. Yeah. So well, yeah, that scene. I should go. I should go dig up that scene with you and Michael Rapport in the bar because it is hilarious. Is it? I would. And, yeah, I would uh, love to see that. Should, oh yeah. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I know. I know. Everybody great. wants. To, you got to do a like a. You got to pitch Netflix a show, man, of all the shit we cut out. Let's pitch that show. I bet you that would probably be the highest rated show of all time. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, we never we never cut anything. I think I'm I'm joking with you right. when I say, hey, JB, you know, we, we protected you by keeping this and this about. Right. I didn't. You know, I, yeah. I, I tell people all the time. I go, A, people accuse us of somehow propping you up. But that isn't who you really were. You were performing for the cameras, and anybody who knows you knows that's not true. That, right, that right. you were that you were you're the same off camera as you were on. But there were things that we left out, and we do this for everybody. Right. Uh, occasionally, somebody will say something. Sure, sure. That if if taken out of context, sure, uh, it may it may kind of be. Now you're fired even before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah, it, I and it's, I. I I, I, you know, if a coach gets fired because of something that's said on the show or if sure. somebody catches heat for something they say or do on the show and it's true and it's who they are, I have yeah. an obligation to show it. Yeah, we, yeah. We tell everybody that we film, that's the case. Yeah. But I think there's sometimes somebody will say something and it isn't, it's somehow, it, if, if we only included that little quote, that could be taken out of context. Sure. And it wouldn't be an accurate reflection of what was really happening in that particular scene. And I think reality TV is genius at using those moments to exploit and kind of get people riled up. We as documentarians try to avoid that. We we no. try to look for something bigger and deeper. No, I hear you. I hear you. What saying and going into that, what what was your most challenging season? I mean, maybe maybe the most challenging kid to get on camera or Maybe do you wish you could have just filmed more? But like you said already, you think I think you already touched on that. But for whatever reason, uh, maybe a kid or a coach or somebody didn't want to be on camera as much. I know like a Jermaine Johnson or a Coy Dang. Those are two guys that will probably get drafted. Um, I know they didn't want to be on camera as much. But did you have the? What was your most challenging season? Was it cheer? Was it basketball? Is it was it a, was it a, one of the three football schools? I mean, did you have one or are they all the same or? What is your thought? Uh, I think every single season that I think I think I'd go back even further. Every movie yeah, I've ever yeah. made. Right. Uh, you know, I, I made three documentaries before we started doing these series. Right. It is. It's like wrestling a grizzly bear to the ground. Yeah. It is. They're just hard. They're yeah. just moving parts. Uh, you know, you know, it, in order for the show to work, you, you just have to completely immerse yourself in the world of the characters who you're trying to document. And what's hard about Last Chance You and frankly, Cheer, is that really you don't have a lot of time to do it. I, I spent six years uh, Im embedded in the life of Mitt Romney attempting to tell his story as he ran for president two times. Shit. And even then, that didn't feel like enough time. Even then, I'm like I'm only scratching the surface of this guy. Well, JB, you, you and I got three months together. Yeah. And three, it, 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 with, with the Mitt movie, Mitt is 90 minutes long. Jesus. Last Chance You, your season was eight hours long, both yeah. seasons. So it, it's. And that it wasn't is, enough, probably. From the, yeah. No, no, from the moment you saw us, from the moment we land at Indy, it is you're waking up early and you're going to bed late and you are you're still not enough hours in the day and getting to everything that you want to get to, to film. I mean, I still got people in independence that are yelling at me for, <laughs> for not, for not talking about yeah. how Mickey Mantle was. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? And the monkey yeah, that went to outer can't. space. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I still hear about that for the people in independence. Yeah. The we had the chimp. First monkey that went to outer yeah. space. Yeah. yeah. We had a or chimpanzee. I go, you're right. Yeah. I'm like, shit. I died. It died in space or whatever. I don't know. Did, so did you have a, to piggyback, did you have a favorite season filming of anything? Mitt or uh, Last Chance You? Does something kind of hold heart to your heart dear than something else maybe? I don't know. Uh, 
or do you, do you hold those to like you reserve those? Uh, Cause I understand that too. Um, you know, you could have a favorite player, person, um, season. I don't know. Is, is does that ever, I know that gets asked probably to you. I don't know. I, I it's like, you're, they're like, they're like my children at this point. I no doubt, you know, I, I do have a favorite child, but I'd never admit it. Yeah, it would, no. no, I'm kidding. I really, I, I, you know what, what, what is true. Your wife is, will kill you. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, it really is. You, you know, any parent knows you, you, sure. you, you would, you couldn't, there isn't the favorite child. There isn't one that you have over the other. You just right. you love them, even though they're different. And this is, this is true. I, I will say, I feel like I have the best job in the world. You probably say you do. I, I, Here's why I'd make a plug for why I love what I do. I um, I get this chance to drop in almost like a paratrooper into people's lives. Sure. And especially now, because we've had some success, uh, people, the people that we've chosen, they're kind of excited to have us. And, and you just get to know them and you discover something great about them. And you, it's sort of, it's a, the, the, the satisfaction is twofold. One, you feel good and satisfied that your instincts were correct. Like I sensed when I talked to you on the phone, I think this guy's going to be great. I think he's going to be so interesting. And I think what he's trying to build at independence is special. And what he's up against is a special kind of journey and story. And I think it'll be, I think it'll be really compelling for viewers. And then when that turns out to be true, it's satisfying, but also along the way, what, what makes it true is uh, you and I and me and Emmett Gooden right. or me and, 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 and Calvin or whoever, we get to know each other. And there is, a, there is some point during the process of filming that someone says, all right, I trust you to tell my story. Right. And, um, and when you, when you do that and you have fans react to it and, and they respond to it and, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really satisfying. It, it's great. I, I love it when you open up a whiskey line, the cigar line and Monica goes on dance with the stars. I, I, I just feel, um, so it just feels, it's, it's a great feeling. It's satisfying. It's gotta be a little bit how you feel when you get a player to the NFL, and I know you've had a score of them make it to the NFL. That's what it feels like. It feels like that. It feels like, Oh man, here was somebody who was great. And I got to rub shoulders with somebody who was great and, and share it with the world. I get, to, I got to be uh, helpful and, and moving them to this place where the rest of the world now gets to enjoy them too. No, nah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Greg's being humble, everyone, just so you know, because obviously I don't care. And I, you know, I'm a results oriented business guy. So like without the show, me and Monica have none of this stuff the aforementioned, just so we're clear. Just, I don't care how great you think we are, Greg, because you're the nicest guy in the world. We don't have Ellen DeGeneres or any of this stuff is what you guys uh, showcasing it. So, I mean, it still comes down to that. Well, but, but JB... The reverse is true. If if you guys don't agree to let me film, sure. I don't have a show. Yeah. If you guys aren't who you are, if you're not as interesting as you are, I don't have a show. Yeah. I'm only as good as you guys are. Yeah, I mean, that shit. Hey, head coaches are only as good as their assistants. We always say that. But, you know, uh, so what's your thoughts, man? Let me ask you this. I and and we'll get a few things left and I don't want to hold you much longer. What I appreciate it. Um, if I don't ever coach again or, or I do, what, what, where's your thoughts on that? What do you think? Um, you know, what? just people ask all the day, like right now, Greg, I don't have a burning desire to go back into the, to the profession right now. I don't Now That doesn't mean I won't. I still, I still speak to kids all the time on zoom and I'm still doing zoom meetings with coaches and I'm still affecting somebody. Um, but right now, I mean, and I say this all the time. I said the pandemic probably, as shitty as it is to everyone in the world, uh, uh, it's probably been the best thing for me because, uh, you know, really it's like not being off for two years or going into two years because at the end of the day, I mean, uh, you know, this thing is uh, is really slowing down everything, obviously. We're not even playing football in the state of California, one of the most highly recruited states in America. Like, 
it's it's 18 states that are playing and i think like 16 of them are are, are a bunch of like kids that just got off the farm and uh, the tractor and they probably won't even get recruited unfortunately and not to s- make fun of anyone but i'm just telling you i mean these are states that don't really aren't on on the recruiting radar and uh so i don't know greg i don't know if i'll coach again or or what i'm doing but you know my thing is um you know what if i did something again um you know what tell the fans i i think maybe the, the question is what what is the biggest misconception of either myself or juco in general that's out there that people may not understand well okay I'm are you with me yeah can i'm you with hear you me? Yeah, yeah i'm with you okay so you can edit this jb you edit this if this <laughs> somehow you know but I, here's my take here's my i think um all right you the quote that you gave at the top of the show i'd never heard that quote before i love it but the thing that jumped out at me was um you develop from the negative right and I think there's just no way to cut it. You and the way that you were let go at independence was a negative. Sure. And, um, you know, I don't have to agree with that decision or disagree. Who cares what I think? But I think if I go back in time, there is a, there's a moment where you, you had, you had said, you know, you, you, I know you, I know that you're not anti-Semitic. I know that you're not sympathetic with Hitler. In fact, the right. whole point of what you were saying was you were trying to help this kid. I mean, I, uh, I'm your daddy. I, basically, I, I, Come see my ass. Yeah. 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 I'm going to, and you're kind of joking with him in a way that he would, right. I've seen him joke. I've been on the sidelines when he's joked the same way. Yeah. So I calls himself. I know, that. And, and yeah. I, I think that kid was used as a prop. Me too. By people that you, you had rubbed yep. the wrong way Adults. while you were at the school. Adults. Now, I would say you should be a head coach again. But here's what I would want for you. There's a certain there's a certain diplomacy that comes with that job that I think you should develop. You should develop that as your skill. And I don't think you have to I don't think you have to get rid of your candor right. or your intensity or your passion, because I love that about you. But I wish that you would be better about picking your battle. Yeah. There's just certain people, it's just not worth pissing them off. Right. And there were, there were certain administrators that I feel like you went out of your way to piss off <laughs> while at Independence. <laughs> and you created enemies, and they just became snakes right. that lied in the tall grass. They just waited yeah. for you for an opportunity to get you back because they felt that you'd embarrass them or whatever. Or I told them the truth. I just what I did. I really told them the truth, and they yeah, didn't I, like that. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I would. I would not disagree with that. And at least in the case of a couple of them that I'm thinking of, there were people sure. that you called out, and I think they deserve to be called out. Right. But I also think those probably were not your best battle. Sure. Like if I were your if I were your field general, I would say, JB, it's just not worth dying on that particular hill. Right. Let's let's live to fight another day. Sure. I would let that stuff go. And, and then, you know, just that general, even in spite of all of that, JB, you still had your fans and supporters in independence. And when those guys were kind of taking what that kid had, you know, using that kid's tweet to kind of get back at you and, and create this fervor. And then, and then there was all these people in the middle of independence. They didn't know what to think of you, but then they're reading these things that are just awful. And they go, oh, gosh, we can't have this guy embarrassing our school and our town like this. There was a period of time. There's about, I think if I had to guess, if I go back in time, there's about a 72 hour window in which you were asked to give an apology and your first draft of the apology was kind of an F you. <laughs> it was not, it was not a real apology. Right. Then you wrote a second apology and I have a feeling Tammy helped you with that apology. If I'm remembering correctly. Not probably my lawyer. And maybe your lawyer. Yeah. But it was it was very humble right. and it was sincere, but it was too little, too late. Right. I feel like if that if that apology simply had come first, mm-hmm. you'd still be coaching. You know, whether you want to coach or not, that's a different matter. But right, you'd right. still have the opportunity to coach if you wanted it. 
Um, I, I don't believe the reasons why they fired you. I don't think those were good reasons to fire you, but it, you know, in the court of public opinion, it's really not about what's fair, what's just. And I think if you're going to develop from the negative, which that was a negative, this period of time of, of reflection during the pandemic, you know, there's about no way to cut it, but this is a negative time, but it does, as you just pointed out, it does, there is an opportunity here to contemplate, to think and move forward. And what, I would wish for you, as my friend, I would want for you to develop that sense of diplomacy. And I don't mean being fake. I mean sure. being smart and sensitive to, to what's going on around you and knowing how to navigate an institution like that. Because I think you're a fine football coach. I think you are someone that, um, as much as anybody we've ever filmed, maybe even more so any player that we went and talked to every coach is going to have those players that, that are detractors that don't love them because it's, you know, just as you said earlier on, you, you get cut. Uh, people are, have a hard time owning up to why they got cut. So it's easy to blame the coach, but consistently across the board, the players that we got to know when we asked them about you, they, they loved you. They recognized what you were trying to do for them and uh and and they would they would lie down in front of a bus for you and i i think i think that's a pretty winning argument nobody's perfect i mean i'm i'm gonna everybody's gonna be different jb and i'm not i'm not saying this to be critical of you sure. there if i were a coach i would do things differently than the way that you do coaches the sure. way that you coached i mean right, i would right. you know, gosh you know jb is he's kind, of, he's kind of hard on that kid or he's kind of hard on those assistant coaches having said that i could only pray that the players that I coached would speak about me as glowingly as your players speak about you. No, I appreciate that, man. Um, and you know, I know, I know how you, I know what you think and how we are. So I, I appreciate it. Like I, and everyone, and shit, I, you know me, I want to be honest and, and let everybody know the, the, you know, real recognize is real. And like I said, you know, there, you know, obviously the show only showed what it could and, and fit in what you can and, and, and those type of things. And so, um, you know, people want to know, People always ask that, and so that's why I was just like, you know, there's always these misconceptions, and, and it is what it is. Like, I never blame kids. I tell that all the time. I don't ever blame a kid because kids know what they know and don't know what they don't know. And those adults are who I blame because those adults wanted some clout, and those adults I pissed off, like you said. And and I knew that. You know what I mean? That's a detriment to myself being as honest as I am probably. It's probably as big as detriment I have, you know, and that's like you do. You got to – you got to you got to play the political role. And, you know, when I, when you when you're raised by a trucker and a truck driving mechanic, a truck diesel mechanic and uh, who comes home and uh, is drinking from 6 a.m. to midnight and comes home and tells you don't kiss anyone's ass. That's embedded in your soul. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, yeah. well, shit, I can't kiss no one's ass. I, I'm going to tell them how it is. But, you know, um, so, you know, that's just kind of what it is. But what uh. What was your, what, tell everybody, and I only got two more questions, Greg. I know we've run along. What, what is the miss, what is the difference, I guess, between the national JUCO stage filming and then the California? Because everybody's asking me, and I'm a California guy. So I'm a California JUCO product. I'm a, I'm a JUCO through and through, and I'm a Cali JUCO guy. So I'm 15 years California JUCO guy. So, you know, I already knew what it was going to be without even watching anything. And I haven't watched the fifth season. I've watched uh, one one sh episode of it so far. And I know what it is because Cali Juco just doesn't have the investment. They don't have the full-time coaches. They don't have the dorms, the cafeterias. Um, they don't have those things. Is that you, Greg, or me? Sorry, I think it's the truck that's backing oh, up. Okay. I'm going to move to another room. Oh, no, you're good. Sorry uh, about that. No, you're fine. So is it, what is the biggest difference or takeaway from, from, from the national JUCO stage where we have cafeterias, dorms, scholarships, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What is your takeaway from it after being, you know, being able to film it? Uh, you went from two towns of 9,000 in a town of whatever, a thousand to a town of, of, of 3 million, you know, what's the difference, um, uh, I guess in the dynamic of not only playing on the field, but everyday life. Well, I, I think that, um, 
in, in California because they don't offer scholarships, they don't offer housing, they don't offer food. And because I think uh, high school education in California is a little more efficient at graduating right. football players from high school that are eligible to go play Division One. Definitely, there's a lot of states that that struggle. You know, yep. Um, exactly what I said. Exactly what I said on the podcast. Yep. So, just if you were to go to any California JUCO, you are going to find uh, one or two, or sometimes more players that could play anywhere in the country, any other JUCO program in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, when we came and filmed you in Indy, you had, my gosh, you had 45 guys that yeah. each year were, were leaving your program to go to a division one school. Yeah. National, Whereas national record. You, you go, you go to the top Cali Juco. I mean the very best Cali Juco 10 and you won't have yeah. a single one yeah. that'll have double figures going yeah. to D one. You'll have a, you'll have a couple. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and, and those, those, because, and that's a tribute to how, the, the talent that exists in, in California for football, right? Um, you're still going to have a couple that are that are going to have a shot at the NFL, but um, yeah, it's just boy to document that struggle, JB. And you told me about it. Yeah, where you've got sometimes 12 kids to an apartment, or you got a <laughs> you got a kid sleeping in his car. You've yeah. got most of them that are that are working a full time job while they're playing football. My gosh, hats off to those kids. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind making whatever you do with this. You can edit this out if it doesn't fit towards the end of the show. But you, you, you raise a really good point in that if you're hoping that a kid comes and plays football for you, and then in exchange you're giving them a scholarship, if you're that player, you gotta you gotta ask, well, scholarship for what? And junior colleges are uniquely positioned to prepare a lot of these young men, and given the sport, young women for life. Uh, because at junior college, they'll have a whole department of trades. They'll have uh, a whole, a, a, in addition to academic studies. And I think junior colleges are better suited to meet a lot of these uh, players, these young men and young women, and meeting them where they are at academically. I think if you're somebody that has, has you know, I'm thinking of a couple of players in particular who I got the impression their whole lives from starting in grade school right. through high school, they were just pushed along on because of their sheer football talent. Like nobody wanted to flunk them. Nobody wanted to get in the way of this unbelievable talent that they could see that they possess. And so, you know, physically as a football player, they would come fully formed to the junior college. But academically, they had not been given the proper training. They were not properly prepared to take advantage of what an institution one day would offer them. And so I think a junior college is a perfect place to help prepare a young man and a young woman for that next step. But the problem is, as you know, JB, it's just the demands of even playing junior college football, especially if it's a Cali Duco where you've spent two hours of your day driving to campus and then two more hours driving home from campus and then at least four or five or six hours working a full-time job that has had nothing to do but taking advantage of your studies or whatever it is that you might do outside of football. And now I'm not even counting what's required in terms of weightlifting, training, practice, games. It's just a lot we're asking of these young people. And I, I think, I think Cali Juco's in particular, but I think sports generally college athletics generally could do a lot more to meet these people halfway to really ensure that that trade that they're making where they're giving of their, they're, they're donating their athletic talent. And sometimes they're, they're donating their health, right. mental health and physical health to, to wear the Jersey of the school. I think, I think schools could do more to meet them halfway. Um, there's no doubt about it. I used to fight that all the time with admin, but you know, California doesn't have the investment that, that the other states have is football, you know, obviously high school game, you know, at a homecoming game in San Diego or LA or orange County, you, you might get 2000 people, but 
you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Broken Arrow versus Union, you got 40,000. And that's just a regular season game. I mean, the investment is just a totally yeah. different deal. People don't understand it uh, that are from California. And uh, you don't know until you go out and live it and see it. And there's just a huge difference in, in buy in. So, I don't know. People people don't really get that. And they, they, they know I'm from Cali and they say that. And they're like, no, no, no. I'm like, yeah, okay, you better go see. But, you know. Uh, well, I would say this the, the, the UC system is something that, it could be a pattern in a lot of ways that the rest of the country could follow. I think yeah. they provide an education that uh, is at an affordable cost. If you're a resident of California and yeah, my hat's off. Right. I just think for, for athletes and I, and I respect what they're trying to do. They don't want to give an athlete any more of an advantage or a perk that any student can receive. And I think that there's a certain logic to that. I, I buy where they're coming from, but man, what's, what do you do when you've got this kid that has the kind of God-given talent that Rajon Wright has from, from Laney this last year or, right. or, or, or Dior Walker Scott where, you know, they, with just a little bit of help, right. they, they could go play. And, right. and not only that, if you do it in the right way, they could also be set up and prepared for the rest of their life. Um, yeah. It's, I'm, not, I'm not claiming to have all the answers, JB, but I, I know that if we put our heads together, we can figure it out. No, I know. And California Juco, man, just, I've been saying this for years, even when I was a Cali Juco guy, because I was the only one in Cali for a long time bringing out of staters in and figuring out how to house them and do these things. Well, all those things are technically illegal. So I knew going in, I'm yeah. like, okay, so Greg has to be super careful. And I know Beam or whoever has talked to him about, listen, we have these rules out here that Kansas don't have. And obviously, um, I told you about it before, but you did a hell of a job because I was just watching what I saw and I'm just like, well, you know, you can't do much about the kid in the car. That's what people don't understand. Like, they're, oh, JB, you never had a kid sleep in your car. You never had a kid go hungry. No, but I wasn't being filmed at the time. And it, there is some things you have to do and there's things you can't do and all these things. So it is what it is. And I know, I think you did a hell of a job for, for being in California. I know the gentrification deal in Oakland and all that San Jose and, it's huge. And, and I, you know, I, I get all that stuff. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I, I, the first episode I already saw saying certain things. I'm just like, well, you know, each is own, everyone's different. And they, 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 they have a great, um, you know, people say, man, you know, we won it all 17 and then 18 were shitty. We're two and eight with it was still another talented team. I mean, we still had 40 guys go D one. I mean, nothing really changed besides the nucleus. And I think, the second year being on film was harder because everyone knew that you guys were coming back. And we had every, that was an invitation basically to every shit bird in America to that wants to be on camera. And that's not only for guys, that was for females coming from out of state to live in the dorms with those guys on camera. That's the difference that people don't understand either. I said, I, I would take a California Juco in that instance going into year two on last chance you than I would in Kansas because I wouldn't have to worry about the damn dorms and, and these females coming out here to try to be on camera with these certain guys, you know, how many girls wanted to be on camera with Raheem Boyd and you, you, people don't know the inner workings of that. And, uh, it is what it is, man. But, but, you know, um, I'll leave you at this, Greg, you know, what, if you could do one more season of football, man, where would it be? And, and who would be your coach? Well, man, I, I, hey, I, I, fans, I know he won't answer this, so I had to do that to fuck with him. So just so you guys are clear, but um, I know fans are asking that question. So, well, I, I and I'm not being diplomatic. I, I will tell you, I, I, every stop I've made, I'm unbelievably grateful to the head coach because sure. no one has more to lose by what we're doing than the head coach. So sure. that, that goes with Buddy Stevens, who showed a lot of courage to say, yeah. Sure. Come film me, and then after the first season, all right, look, I don't like what I saw. I'm going to try and make some improvements, but the deal is still the same. You come and film me, and I'm, I'm going to be open. And then there was you. We've never met more of an open book than you. And, and Coach Bean, same thing. I mean, they, he, was, he was somebody that, that looked us in the eye, and, and we interviewed a lot of schools. And uh, he just said, look, we've got nothing to hide here. If, you're, if you guys are going to be honest about what we're doing, I have nothing to hide, and he opened up. So he, he, we've filmed three college football coaches. Each one of them I'm unbelievably grateful to. Each right. one of them. Right. 
What would you uh would you ever film me again on a if I got a job? Oh yeah, JD, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'd love to film you again. Maybe me, maybe I can do a show like me fucking walking Stogie down the street or something. We just film that. I don't know, or me cooking. Well, I, know I, I know everybody wants viewers. me to cook. Everybody wants a JB cooking <laughs> show with Charlie Wilson, me, Charlie Wilson, and 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 and, and Stogie maybe cooking. Hey, I will. I will. Anybody that knows this, I'm not making this up. The best meal, the best meals we ever had while we were in independence were at JB's house, him cooking for us. Have him. He can, he can make scallops that he bought from Walmart <laughs> taste like you're at a Michelin star restaurant. I'm not, hey. and I'm not exaggerating. Hey. You are good. You are a great cook. Hey, well you, this is on the record too. Now I mean, he, he rubbing my back. I got to rub his Greg has seen. He literally, I'm not lying to you has the best chocolate chip cookie I've ever fucking tasted in my entire life. That's on record. I've he knows I've told him this. The best chocolate chip cookies he makes from scratch. I tried to emulate it, and I made it for his crew when uh, in my house in Kansas one day after Greg taught me in San Diego. I went back to Kansas. I I made the cookie, and it was close. And ever since then, I can't even come close. I, I make horrible. I burn them. I fucking don't cook them enough. Like it's horrible. So I'm a horrible baker. I can cook on every platform but i just can't i'm not a baker so i guess that's the alpha well, male it, in me i don't know it's like malik henry he could show me how to throw a deep ball <laughs> but it's another it's another thing to execute it it's another thing to actually do it i i have result i have a pretty good deep ball in yeah. my chocolate chip cookie I'll, oh I'll, man I'll give you that. it's unbelievable but hey man i appreciate you greg and uh like i said man hopefully we'll we'll hook up again and Maybe we can pitch Netflix another show. But what's what's next? Let everybody know what's next for you. I mean, are you got what's in the what's in the oven? We got this basketball show in the can. We shot it. Did it get uh, did it get shut it down by week. COVID? I just wanted to know that. I, I can't I can't blow the ending. I can't confirm or deny what role COVID played in the show. But I will just tell you. Oh, so it's we got you're still. Show. Oh, I thought you were still filming it because it got stopped. I'm sorry. Okay, I no. got you. I got you. No. Okay, I yeah, got you. Yeah, we got it. This, When's that come out? And. Uh, I think they haven't announced a release date yet. If I had to guess it'd be sometime January. I don't know, March. Oh, okay. I think later, later in January. Oh, okay. We'll deliver the show to Netflix in January, and then and then they got to do their. I got they got to dub it into like 115 different languages and all that. Shout so out to there. So everybody knows, uh, Greg's filming a basketball show at Elac, uh, which I coached at. I was I was O coordinator there back in 2005, so I knew some people there. Um, so it's it's, it's small world. Yeah, we, we loved our time there, and uh, the AD uh, remembered who you were. I think I think I think you and he were friends. I didn't know that when we went there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. Huh? Interesting. So that so you got that going, and then uh, did you do another cheer or no? We're we're still working on that. that oh, one, okay. That one's that one's uh, yeah tricky. Still, huh? Gotcha. Still trying to figure that one. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, shit. Well, hey, whatever you do, man, I, you know, I, like I wish you the best. Anything you need. Um, and I did have one last question. Back, people were asking, people were asking, Greg, did you do like a where are they now deal like you did last year? Because I don't know. People were saying it wasn't there. But is that was that not allowed or something? No, we didn't. We didn't have it. I, I, I think that might be fun to talk them into it um, maybe five years from now. But we did two consecutive years of where they are now. And it was, I just, we didn't really have much more to say. It was kind, yeah, of, it yeah. was kind of the, we were starting to repeat ourselves with the, where are they now? Episode. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we just, we decided no, to access. I, so, I wanted, the only yeah. reason I asked, I wanted to know, cause I had my damn whiskey filmed on there. I was going to give my whiskey a damn shout out. So thanks for screwing me on that, Greg. I appreciate you. Um, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> um, you know, I, I got, I, I should get to that footage. That, we have great footage of you. Of you launching your whiskey line, it's amazing. Man, I wish I. Man, if you can give me that shit, I'll. I, that'd be great. And the rap report scene. Look and, and the rap report scene. That'd be great. Yeah, there's a there's a whole other show and all the cutting room floor <laughs> material for sure. Hell yeah! Hey, are you still got? Uh, how, how is your social life? Like, are you still you still got a uh, same girlfriend? Man, I'm still I'm hanging in there. I'm doing the same old same old. Yeah, it's going all right. You, I know you I, always want to know I, that. I know you always love asking that I, question. Greg always asks that I, question. 
Just curious. <laughs> hey, make me some cookies, man. All right, you got it. Next time you're in town, you look me up. Hey, how, how's uh, the kids all right? Uh, is he on his mission? Yeah, I got a kid on a church mission. He is in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska right now. I saw that. Uh, he's in or around Colorado and Wyoming, but he's in Nebraska right now. And, Man, this is um, a small world, Greg, not to cut you off. My father was a truck driver in his early ages, and I have a picture in my home right now that he and his buddy were in the driving across country from California. They, they flipped a 18-wheeler in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska onto the top of the really? truck. Yep. I got the picture. My dad was in the sleeper at the time. The guy, the guy fell asleep and uh, he don't know how he lived, but they were woke up on the top. The, uh, the truck was flipped all the way on its, on its, on its roof. Oh my gosh. Scott's bluff. Well, that's crazy. From what I, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I, I get the, I get the sense there's, there's a lot of things. Uh, Scott's bluff is an interesting part of the country. Oh, uh, but <laughs> my son loves it. He really? loves it. He That's loves good. it in Scott's Bluff. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, shit. He loved independent. So same shit, but yeah, good job. <laughs> hey, Greg. Uh, hey man, I appreciate you coming on, man. And I, uh, shit, we, this is the longest podcast in the history of podcasts and I appreciate it. And, uh, Hey, anytime you need me, let me know, brother. You know, I'm here. And if I come back down there, uh, well, shit, I'm not too far. You got to come see the new house anyway. I'd love it. I'd love it. My, listen, it'd be my pleasure, and, and, and I'd love talking to you. It's great talking to you, JB. Make time, and seriously, make time. Tell your wife, and uh, and I'll cook dinner, and I'll get you guys down here. Okay. All right. I'm going to let her know. All right. Good deal. Talk to you soon, JB. All right, Greg. Appreciate you. Bye. Bye. That was Greg Whiteley, producer, Last Chance You, and uh, like I said, uh, shit, longest, longest uh, podcast ever, man. So, hey, shout out to my YouTube guys, man. I appreciate you guys tuning into that, and uh, I tried to be as candid as possible at the same time, respecting Greg and uh, what he does, man, and uh, he does a great job for all those shows that he's created. So, um, but at least I did ask some real questions that we wanted and uh, wanted to know. And I know I, my fans wanted to know. So hopefully we got some answered. And uh, obviously I could have asked a lot more. But, you know, like I said, Greg's a good dude and uh, I know he means well. So um, at least you got to hear from uh, the horse's mouth on how he directs and produces the show. So, hey, man, I appreciate everybody out there. A long show. I'll get it going. I'll get it up and loaded. And, uh, Appreciate you guys tuning in. YouTube subscribers, I appreciate you becoming a member. And, uh, hey, man, stay safe out there. And It's a great day to have a great fucking day. Peace. <laughs> Wrong fucking uh, deal, but, hey, I'll edit it. Hey, I appreciate you guys. Peace. Hope this ain't my last chance. It's the last chance for me. Will I make it? Will I take it to the top? We gon' see. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. Will I make it? Will I take it to the top? We gon' see. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. Man, I'm just telling you. Coach, I don't want to fucking hear your mouth. I'm tired of hearing guys talk back, man. Just say yes, sir. Coach, he's fucking hiring me. I don't know, no man. Fucking sick of it. Take your ass off.